look at um, the investments uh, in the U.S. I've got the data for the U.S. Um, what I think is going to be interesting here is how uh, the investments have changed over time and how they've changed across agencies um, in terms of just sort of thinking about the way the community is looking at uh, its investments in computing. As you'll see from those numbers, uh, there's uh, a change in where at least the U.S. is investing, and one question that um, certainly keeps coming up here is whether clouds are a much cheaper way to provide computing infrastructure. So uh, I looked at uh, that about a year ago, and I've just looked at it again. Uh, other people have looked at it. I'll give you some just some numbers um, that uh, maybe will answer that question um, with data rather than the sort of um, hype that we often hear, and maybe it'll provide some good discussions. One of the things, though, that's interesting about um, looking at this has been that no matter who you talk to, everybody looks at computing uh, as essentially interchangeable, even when they know better. And uh, in the last part of the talk, I'm going to look a little more at you know, some of the uh, experiences we've had looking at uh, I.O. in high-performance computing systems and suggest that, that maybe we should be looking at the way we think about computing very differently. So in the U.S., there's this um, uh, tool that, gives a, that you can use, and you can use it um, if you get bored with the talk. Um, you get a lot of information on how one of the uh, providers of high performance computing in the U.S., the National Science Foundation, how that resource is being uh, distributed across different research groups, different areas of science, um, and different systems. One of the things that's interesting about it is it gives you a way to look at what is sometimes called the long tail. So um, if you look at the allocation of research dollars in almost any field, you'll find that a few groups, sometimes a few scientists, a uh, few projects receive a lot of the funding, maybe 80, 90 percent or more, but then that there are hundreds, maybe thousands, tens of thousands of individuals also doing good science that receive much more modest funding, and that's often called um, the long tail. One interesting thing about this data, as I mentioned, is it's still very compute-centric. Uh, it doesn't really discriminate about different kinds of computing. Um, and it only covers what's called exceed. So there is a sort of federation of computing systems in the US that uh, run as a federation. And the name of the federation is exceed. Uh, exceed doesn't, in fact, own any of the resources, but it provides support for them accounting, consulting, and so forth. So here are some uh, examples of the kind of data that you get. And uh, they may be a little hard to read, um, but you don't really need to. As you can see, they're pretty much the same. Uh, they run over about 10 years. And um, there are these infamous up and to the right graphs. So everything is increasing up. Um, whether it's um, uh, the number of institutions, that's the graph on the far left, um, the number of principal investigators, uh, leaders of the projects, and the one on the bottom is the number of, of active users. So those are people who have uh, logged on and maybe run something. Um, it's probably the complement of the set of uh, active PIs. Um, the allocations have grown the same way. So uh, the graph there on the upper left, you see uh, a uh, cons you know, pretty consistent rise in um, allocations. And that the allocations pretty much tracks the available systems. Um, that big jump is was caused by adding a system called Stampede, a system that's at the Texas Advanced Computing Center, um, that's a large cluster equipped with Intel Phi's. So a lot of that computing power, in fact, uh, the lion's share of that computing power 
is on uh, the accelerators, uh, in this case, the Intel mics or Intel Phi's. And you can see the, um, uh, the size of the allocations. And again, this is, is all in terms of compute cycles. It doesn't discriminate between um, compute cycles on a regular CPU, on, on a GPU, on an Intel Phi, um, uh, if there was one, it wouldn't discriminate against ones on a, a vector machine. And again, that big blip was the uh, allocations on the uh, uh, Stampede, the Intel Phi equipped machine. Um, maybe a little more interesting to look at, um, and this one you should pay a little more attention to. This is the amount of resources that have been allocated by the NSF directorate. So there are directorates for um, mathematical and physical sciences. So that's where um, uh, astronomy, materials science, physics, that's the, the top curve here. Um, the interesting one maybe to look at is the blue curve. Um, the one that starts off as the bottom curve uh, in 2005, um, that's for the social, behavioral, uh, and economic sciences. And an interesting thing to note about that is that um, by about 2013, um, the, well, maybe even by, say, 2012, um, they were getting as much time allocated as math and physical sciences was getting just in 2005. Uh, so there are two things to take from this part of uh, this graph. One is that there just continues to have been a growth in the demand in computing uh, pretty much across um, all areas of science, um, and that um, areas that you would think of as uh, maybe not using computing at all, and that's the, the yellow curve, which starts tracking in about uh, 2010, that's the humanities and the arts um, that are using allocations of time on what is um, NSF's um, large-scale or advanced computing uh, system resource. So this is not just providing um, artists with um, small computers um, to work on or even campus-level machines. These are researchers in the humanities and the arts that needed more computing than could be provided by, for example, a single institution. Um, the other thing to notice about this is that it is flattened out. Uh, but that is the supply side view. This is not the demand side view. Uh, what this reflects is that over the last couple of years, the supply of um, computing, uh, at least from the National Science Foundation in the US, um, has pretty much stagnated. Um, there hasn't been a major large-scale acquisition recently, and uh, it'll be interesting to see what happens over the next couple of years. Um, it is a bit harder um, to get the demand side view. So for Exceed, the demand side information exists, and uh, you, can, um, you can get it from them. Uh, you try hard enough. Um, typically, the, the demand is about three to five times the supply based on the requests. Um, and if you look at the US Department of Energy, which also has a program that offers time on its supercomputing systems called the Insight Program, um, it has essentially the same level of oversubscription uh, that is about a three to five X uh, demand compared to supply. Now, of course, um, nature abhors a vacuum. Um, demand always um, expands to exceed available resources. Users know how much is available, so they may inflate their demands so that they get what they need and so forth. Um, so that's a, a difficult question to answer. Um, interestingly enough, um, you would think, you know, given the investment, and it's a fairly large investment in computing um, at the National Science Foundation, that this would be a well-known resource. But in fact, many of my own colleagues in my computer science department had no idea that this uh, facility even existed. Um, in addition, um, and something which is relevant to a discussion of clouds, is that the allocation process uh, and its overhead 
uh, is cumbersome by cloud standards. Um, it's a very conventional process by which you turn in a proposal, it's evaluated and reviewed, and there is a panel that gets together and makes awards. Um, that may be okay for the large the users that are consuming the bulk of the time on the system, but for what I call the long tail, the users who need much smaller uh, amounts of time, but they need it on a resource that they can't get locally, this is quite a burden. And the lack of, of just um, organization and detail behind this um, was somewhat frustrating, and it's not the way uh, a lot of science is done. Uh, so, for example, um, in, the, uh, uh, in astronomy, um, they put together a plan that uh, figures out what science they're going to do, um, how much money they would like spent on the equipment for that science. Um, they, in fact, spend a fair amount of time make, doing the plan. So um, you can go to the National Academy, uh, U.S. National Academy websites. There's a, um, they, they publish a lot of these reports. Um, the PDFs are usually free. Um, this is an example of one. In order to put this together to figure out what they were going to ask for, they were going to say, we need this kind of telescope, or we need this sequence of telescopes, this kind of equipment. Um, they got 450 white papers. They did 17 town halls. They had 27 panel meetings. Um, and the study committee, uh, which uh, is run by the, um, the National Academies, uh, and it's not run for free, um, had um, six meetings and over 100 telecons. Um, and it does make um, funding levels. One of the reasons I mentioned this is that I like to use telescopes as a example of the way we should be thinking about computing. Um, you won't find a thoughtful astronomer who will say that there is a way to linearly rank telescopes. You've got radio telescopes, you've got uh, optical telescopes, you've got gamma ray telescopes. Each of them is important. Each of them has uh, a part of the spectrum or uh, uh, ability to gather um, electromagnetic radiation in the spectrum that is important for addressing certain parts of science. It's not like you can say, uh, here's a top 500 list of uh, telescopes because there's no way to rank it and there's no reason to find a way to rank them. What you want to do is think about the science you want to do and what are the characteristics of the equipment that you need to do that science. And then you need to convince the policymakers to give you enough money to build those systems. Um, I think this is quite sensible. You need to spend money to figure out what it is you need to do. And we all know this in computing. Um, there are lots of different characteristics of, of computers that make a big difference about on how well they can address different kinds of science problems. But yet, we tend to put together lists of computers. We tend to discuss the way we've allocated the resources as if a cycle on a uh, CPU is the same as a cycle on an NVIDIA GPU, is the same as a cycle on a uh, Intel mic and is the same as a cycle on a machine with a lot of cash and, and a uh, machine with no cash at all. And we all know this is not true, but we persist in doing it. So this is really a bad idea. Um, we can also look a little bit, um, I'll go through these quickly because I want to get to some of the IO, but um, there's also another um, website in the US where you can go and look at what the U.S. thinks it is spending on um, information technology, and this is the uh, Network Information Technology, R&D, the NIDR D. Um, it's looked at the investments across um, these uh, eight areas. So there's high-end computing, which is roughly supercomputing. There's infrastructure and applications and research and development. Now, the first thing I'll say is that um, it's not clear that anybody even knows what these are or how to distinguish them um, and how they are different from, um, say, uh, 
software design and productivity uh, or from each other. Um, but one of the reasons we want to look at these is it, gives, it does give you some idea of what the policymakers are finding important, where the investment is going, and what's changing. Um, oh, I should say there are lots of caveats here. Um, when you talk to people who put these together, it's amazing how um, seat of the pants it is. So here's the US government-wide investment. So that red line is the high-end computing um, infrastructure and applications. So for us supercomputing people, that looks kind of nice. Um, the, the line that has the best upward trend, um, that blue one is um, cybersecurity and information assurance. So that's the, um, gee, people are doing bad things to us um, line. Um, and then uh, the uh, HCIM, the um, uh, human computer interactions and stuff, um, that's the sort of lightish uh, blue line that is the um, second largest. Um, you can also look at these as a percent of, of total. So here you can also see that um, across the US, uh, the single biggest category is still the investment in uh, supercomputing. But we look at just the National Science Foundation, it's a different picture. And there's some interesting um, trends in this picture. So one is that, well, there was a, a blip um, uh, between about 2007 and 2012. Um, that, uh, a significant part of that is actually Blue Waters, um, as well as uh, some acquisitions for the machines that Exceed is running. Um, some of that came from the US uh, economic program after the financial collapse to pump money into the economy. Um, if you remove that blip, um, the investment in high performance computing, the, the high end computing information, uh, infrastructure and applications about constant. Um, everything else has been trending up. Um, and in fact, the biggest category at NSF is now the human computer uh, uh, interactions, um, and one of the um, up and growing categories is the cybersecurity and information assurance. Um, and you can look at this as a percent of total. Um, this one gives you the, uh, the absolute numbers, and then uh, this one is, um, is one of those sort of cumulative charts. And that red, shrinking red bar in the middle is the high-end computing. Um, so the uh, so unlike the sort of overall U.S. picture, um, the basic science agency, because that's what the National Science Foundation is in the U.S., um, has been decreasing its um, investment in the high-end computing. Um, and again, I think one of the reasons for this is that there's a misunderstanding of what it takes to do computing. So if you think of everything as completely interchangeable, um, looks like it's pretty easy to replace those systems with um, individual GPU equipped systems or maybe even clouds. Um, and so we can look at clouds. Uh, and when I ask people um, what they're looking for in a cloud, I get lots of different answers. Um, for some people, it really is this um, flexible service model that I alluded to a little earlier. Um, the fact that uh, if I, want to run on a cloud, I need a um, couple hundred nodes, and I want to do it uh, later today, I can do it. All I need is enough money on a credit card. I don't need to go through any kind of review process or anything other than being able to spend the money. Um, for a lot of uses, this is uh, possibly much better than a much heavier weight process. It's difficult to implement that given the sort of policies we have in the US for research, but um, it is something one could be thinking about in terms of the, the trade-offs and the total cost. Um, for other people, it's the fact that it's a, a shared resource um, with a cost advantage. Um, we used to call this time sharing, um, but it's more than that. There's um, uh, sometimes what's being shared is not the computing itself, again, Maybe it's the data sources, maybe it's the applications, um, maybe it's the user communities. Um, it's also quite accessible. This is one of the uh, parts of the definition that sometimes gets um, missed, but the uh, 
the fact that you can now take advantage of being on the network to provide these resources everywhere is great. Um, and uh, virtualization of resources is um, critical for some uses and completely irrelevant for others. Um, as we look at these, it becomes, again, tricky to understand how you would um, compare um, the costs of, say, investing in a supercomputing center versus um, buying a cloud. Now, I've heard presentations from um, certain major commercial vendors that say that we're all nuts for um, considering operating our own centers, that um, uh, you know, a large company that I won't name um, could always do it cheaper. Um, but we can look at the we can look at the numbers and see if they're right. So um, I took a different vendor. Um, uh, so this is not the one that uh, I uh, I and in fact David heard um, claiming that um, uh, they could do it more cheaply. Uh, I will say, however, that these prices are comparable to that other vendor's price. So I went to Amazon, looked at an EC2 instance, roughly the size in terms of cycles of the Blue Water system here at Illinois. So 22,000 nodes, each with, um, well, the closest I could get was 60 um, uh, Gebby bytes of uh, memory and 32 cores per node. Um, that comes to uh, a little, uh, just about 28, well, and this was in, um, this was a year ago in 2014. That comes to about $28 million a month if you buy it on demand. Um, there is a way to uh, essentially buy at a discount by buying in bulk. So you can buy three years at a time in Amazon. That uh, last year would have reduced the price to about um, six million a month. Our machine also has a little over 4,000 nodes with GPUs. That adds about um, two million a month if on demand or in 200,000 a month um, if you buy them in lots of three years. But I need to, Again, remind you, this just buys you the cycles. Um, that doesn't get any data in and out of the machine. Um, our machine has multiple hundred um, uh, gigabit links um, to the outside world. Um, it doesn't give you any data support. So our machine has 26 petabytes of disk and 320 petabytes of tape. Um, with over one terabyte per second to disk. It doesn't get you a high performance, low latency interconnect. It doesn't get you any user support. And that's only basic Linux. If you want, say, uh, SUSE Enterprise, that adds about 200,000 a month. Right. So um, if you um, buy in bulk by the discount rate, that would be about $373 million over five years. So that's... Um, <laughs> roughly double what we're paying for a vastly more capable supercomputer. And that's not getting you any of the um, human support um, that uh, we're also providing here. And if you did it on demand, that would be about $1.8 billion. Um, All right. So um, I just went for uh, this talk. I went and looked at what the prices would be now. Um, and um, it's basically the same. Um, the on-demand cost was almost identical. Um, the three-year prices have all gone up significantly. <laughs> um, so the, um, uh, the three-year cost would now be almost $900 million. And the um, uh, on-demand rates, again, still about $2 billion. So this is not to say that clouds are bad, um, but, but clouds have to deal with the same economics that everybody else does. They're not a magic solution um, for the problem of providing computing. So um, this interlude here um, is basically suggesting that when anybody tells you the cloud is the answer, um, run the numbers. Um, and sometimes the numbers will tell you yes, and sometimes the numbers will tell you um, really way, way no. Okay. So. Um, Part two, uh, again, it, it, we keep falling back into talking about compute because this is what we tend to measure. Um, 
And even when I talk to big data people, we they almost always drop back into, well, I can get all those cycles instead of talking about uh, my ability to process data. Um, but as we look at real science applications, we do run into these problems. And so I did want to briefly give you some uh, examples of what we've learned about the IO performance of applications on uh, some of the large supercomputers uh, in the US. Um, so uh, how bad is it? Well, uh, I'm going to show you um, some data. A lot of this came from um, a paper that uh, a student that I shared with, Marianne Winslet, um, worked on with um, uh, some of our colleagues um, and uh, presented it at HBDC this year. Um, that paper has a lot more data, so I encourage you to go um, look at it. Uh, there's a bunch of pieces here. But we've added to this data um, information that we've taken from our Blue Water system. So the data in the HPDC paper came entirely from uh, supercomputers operated by the U.S. Department of Energy. We've now added uh, data from uh, Blue Waters, which is National Science Foundation. Um, this data uses um, IO logs that are captured by a tool called um, Darshan. Um, it captures the data at the um, IO function level um, in, at both sort of the POSIX and the uh, MPI interface. It doesn't really capture the, the text IO functions. So if you're doing um, uh, put S's or um, F printf's, it doesn't capture the individual pieces there. So uh, internal buffering by the text routines in the application um, aren't caught. On the other hand, Darshan is very low overhead, so we've been able to convince a number of supercomputing sites to just turn this on and collect it for um, all the users who don't opt out. So there are some caveats. Users can opt out, so about half the users tend to opt out. Um, most users just don't trust anything that they're told about stuff being low overhead. Um, Another caveat which um, surprised me was that uh, most of this data is saved by uh, hooking on to MPI Finalize. Um, that seemed pretty safe, but it turns out there are a lot of applications that do regular checkpoints and they just keep running until they get, um, they exceed their allocation. They never call Finalize. <laughs> um, so we don't get their data either. And then there was some um, uh, operational issues that caused us to, um, be unable to access about half of Blue Waters data. We do have a lot of data. Um, so we have data on over a million jobs and, and over uh, seven years um, total across the system. So um, uh, it hasn't been over a seven year uh, wall clock time, but uh, the, the cumulative time on the four machines um, is almost seven years. And these systems run from um, a fairly modest size of 130,000 cores up to uh, two machines that are essentially around 800,000 cores um, with uh, IO throughputs running from a little under 100 gigabytes per second up to almost a terabyte per second. Um, a lot was invested in these systems to give them really good IO performance and the result is absolutely appalling. So um, notice that um, not only is this a, um, a, a log linear chart, um, log on the y-axis, but the, the separations are factors of 1,000. So um, that first drop for the first 25% of applications is a three order of magnitude drop in performance. Um, by the time you get down to um, uh, that point, um, you're, um, you know, by the time you're down to maybe 50% of the applications, your uh, aggregate I.O. performance across these supercomputer applications is roughly the same as you get with a th single USB um, thumb drive. <laughs> Right. Yes, it is this bad. Um, so here's an example um, that looks at the throughput, um, and this is for Mira, and I'll show uh, another slide, one for Blue Waters. Um, the system peak, in this case, is about uh, a quarter of a terabyte per second. Um, 
but a lot of the applications um, were down around maybe a gigabyte per second to um, 100, like a run to 100 megabytes per second, close to a USB drive. Um, Blue Waters has uh, uh, similar results. Um, and again, one has to look at these closely with these parallel machines, um, you have a high system IO throughput, but in order to get that throughput, the job has to be pretty parallel. So we can also look at the number of processes and um, draw a line indicating sort of what would be the sort of fair share performance. Um, one thing to note is that um, the bandwidth out of a single node um, is over um, five gigabytes per second and a uh, single um, IO server can accept data at about five gigabytes per second. So you can think of that as the minimum performance you should get. Um, and so um, even if you sort of fairly distributed the IO servers across the machine, um, the performance the applications are getting almost entirely falls below that line um, and falls um, below it by orders of magnitude. Um, there are other ways to look at this. I think the quick thing that I want to point out here is that, um, uh, and this is on Mira, 50% um, of the applications never get more than a gigabyte per second. 20% of the applications only use text IO. Um, and that might be okay if they didn't take much time doing their text IO, but some of them are doing text IO and taking a long time. Uh, we can also look at the amount of time um, that's used by the applications. Um, this one is interesting too, because there are two groups of lines. Uh, and it turns out that um, one group is the ones running GPFS and the other group is the ones running Lustre. Um, the ones running um, GPFS are the ones that are slightly better than the ones running Lustre. So th this is a graph that shows um, uh, how much of the total system time is used by what fraction of jobs. And um, what we see is that um, uh, for the Luster system, um, there are a few jobs that are basically consuming all of the IO time. Um, we can look at what would happen if you just took the 15 top applications in terms of their IO time and improved their um, performance. If you simply brought up their performance to one gigabyte per second, so that's one fifth of what I said was like the minimum you should expect out of Blue Waters, um, you could save a significant amount of the whole platform IO time. Um, Darshan allows us to get some fairly uh, detailed information about the applications. So here are the 15 top applications um, on Blue Waters. Um, the names have been removed to protect the sometimes guilty and sometimes innocent. Um, one of the things that you can see from this is um, other than the pretty much uniformly dreadful performance, um, there isn't much of another pattern. Um, uh, many cases, the, the IO performance is fairly tightly distributed around a median, but with lots of, of outliers. In some cases, it's pretty tight. Um, another thing that we see as we look at the applications is that um, most of these applications are using POSIX IO, um, either directly or through fairly thin um, IO libraries. Very few of them are using uh, MPIO. Um, and the ones that are using MPIO often don't get um, enough of a performance benefit from them. Although the uh, applications at the largest scale tend to be using MPIO more than the other applications. And this does give us some information about where the problems are coming from. So one of the things which is um, underappreciated and, and often not understood, uh, certainly by the application developers, but um, often um, even by the computer scientists, um, is that POSIX has an extraordinarily strong consistency model. Um, which makes it incredibly hard to implement both correctly and efficiently. Um, and so um, what we find is that uh, the 
uh, particularly the, the parallel implementations, whether it's GPFS or Lustre, have found a sort of, um, they found an operational spot where um, the file system does not die on a daily basis, um, but may die on a weekly basis. And the performance is pretty bad, but it could be worse. Um, and the uh, operations on the file are probably correct. Um, it's actually so bad that there are a number of supercomputing sites that turn off correctness in order to get more performance. Um, and there are lots of things wrong with the POSIX model. Um, files as IO objects add a lot of metadata choke points. So when you update a file, there's a lot of stuff that also has to happen that you don't think about, but that POSIX requires. And these are hard things to fix. The semantics are hard things to fix. So for example, a lot of people have been talking about using essentially solid state memory, uh, things like burst buffers to improve IO performance. Burst buffers will not improve um, the performance if you maintain these semantics um, because uh, it, a lot of it has to do with cache consistency and metadata issues. Um, as you change the semantics, you can get um, better performance. And in fact, if you look at what's happened in the big data community, they don't use POSIX. They use file systems whose semantics have been designed to meet their needs. Those semantics are, are frankly probably not appropriate for many science needs, but neither is POSIX. Um, and uh, I think one of the most um, damaging things that's been done to high-performance computing in the last decade has been a decision in procurements, uh, and, and it's an uninformed decision in procurements to require POSIX, not understanding the difference between wanting to preserve the POSIX API, the ability to run programs that I have, and this very strong semantics, which is one of these things that seemed like a good idea at the time, but in the context of a massively parallel high-performance computing system, is a real disaster. So I wanted to um, close and open this up for comments. Um, wanted to give you some um, sense of, of the investment trends, um, but a lot of what I wanted to do is just sort of reinforce the notion that we keep thinking about these systems in terms of their compute power, uh, their compute capabilities. We rank them that way, we talk about the investments, we argue with our policymakers about needing more of them, when what we really need is to think of them more like telescopes, um, that machines need to be configured for certain kinds of science. They may still need to be large. We desperately need a replacement for the Hubble Space Telescope. Um, but we, you know, we also need things like Kepler. We need things like the Square Kilometer Array. <clears throat> we frankly need things like the zillion um, amateur telescopes that are used to do supernova spotting. And each of those instruments um, is filling a different need and we need to better understand it. Um, I wanted to give one example of just how poorly we understand how well our applications are doing IO today and uh, encouraging um, you if you're interested in um, looking at a challenging uh, problem where there are, I think, are lots of low-hanging fruit, um, to think about how one could do the I.O. part better and also to get people to talk about it. Um, and there are computer science challenges here. There are also a lot of, of challenges in the algorithms and the mathematics. So with that, um, give you a little um, thanks, particularly to my students um, and the people who gave me money. And I'd be happy to answer any questions. <laughs>